Good morning. My name is uh, Brian Stevenson, and I'm delighted to see you here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a set of issues that uh, are all around us, but don't necessarily get discussed in the way that I think they should. Uh, I have a book out called Just Mercy, and when we're finished, I'll be really pleased to sign books across the hallway. Uh, but I'm an attorney, and I've spent the last 30 years of my uh, life representing people who are condemned, people who are on death row, uh, trying to do something about this phenomenon of mass imprisonment. Uh, the United States is a very con a different country today than it was uh, 30 years ago. In 1972, we had a prison population of 200,000. Today, we have a prison population of 2.3 million. The United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We have some 6 million people on probation or parole. Uh, some 68 million Americans have criminal arrests. Uh, they've uh, been arrested, and that means that when they apply for a job, they may have to report that, and it has fundamentally changed our society. Uh, the Bureau of Justice reports that one in 15 Americans can expect to go to jail or prison uh, during uh, their lifetimes. Uh, for Latino baby boys born in this century, the statistic is one in six. For African Americans, one in three uh, black male baby born, uh, b babies born in this country is expected to go to jail or prison. That wasn't true in the 20th century. That wasn't true in the 19th century. That became true in the 21st century. And so for me, this creates a real challenge for how a society like ours has become so compromised by this phenomenon of over-incarceration. I go into poor communities where I sit down with young kids who are 13 and 14 who honestly tell me that they don't expect to be free or alive by the time they're 21. And that despair is so heartbreaking and yet so real. They don't say that because of something they've seen on TV. They don't say that because of something they've heard. They say that because that's what they've seen happening in their communities. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I think are the dynamics necessary to change these practices. And not only these practices, I believe that whether we're talking about over-incarceration and the criminal justice system, or we're talking about the environment, or we're talking about gender equality, or we're talking about rights for religious minorities or sexual minorities, I believe that there are a few things that we've got to think about if we're going to really change the world, if we're going to really confront injustice. And the first is proximity. I am persuaded that we can't make a difference in the world if we stay distant from the things that we care about. I'm actually a big believer in proximity. I think if you really want to make a difference in challenging uh, the problems that we see around income inequality, you've got to get closer to poor communities and marginalized communities. I think if you want to make a difference in education policy, you've got to spend time in schools where there are many tensions and challenges. I think if you want to do something about racial inequality, you've actually got to get closer to the communities that have been marginalized and burdened by this history and legacy. Proximity, I am persuaded, changes us. It makes us see things that we can't see from a distance. We hear things up close we can't hear from a distance, and that nuance will actually deepen our ability to make a difference. Yes, we've got to get closer to help the people we're trying to help, but I also think we help ourselves. I learned about proximity growing up in a community uh, because in my community, black children could not go to the public schools. I started my education in a colored school. And I remember when lawyers came into our community and they opened up the public school system. And but for their choice to get proximate, I wouldn't likely be standing here talking to you today. But because of their choice, things changed. My dad couldn't go to high school in our county because there was no high school for black kids. But because of these lawyers getting proximate, I got to go to high school. And then I got to go to college, and I had a great time in college. I majored in philosophy, and I was having a, just the time of my life. I, was, I played sports, I did music, and uh, every now and then I would ask my, I'd tell my friends, well, you know, I'm going to go out on the hillside, and I'm going to do some philosophy. And of course, my friends thought that this was me saying I was going to do drugs or something illegal, but it really wasn't. I just really liked thinking these deep, deep thoughts, or what I thought were deep thoughts. And then during my senior year, somebody came up to me and they asked me, well, what are you going to do when you graduate? And all of a sudden, I heard that as a hostile question because I realized nobody was going to pay me to philosophize when I graduated from college. And so I frantically started looking around for ways to extend my education. And I learned very quickly that in this country, 
Uh, if you want to do graduate work in a field, you actually have to know something about that field. I looked into graduate school in history and political science and English, and much to my dismay, these schools told me I needed to know a lot about history, political science, or English, and that was pretty intimidating. And to be honest, that's how I found law school. Because the truth is, you don't need to know anything about law school to go to law school. And so I quickly signed up for law school, and after I graduated, I found myself at Harvard Law School, sitting in a classroom, trying to make sense of what I was hearing. And people were talking about civil procedure and torts and contracts, but I went to law school because I was concerned about racial inequality. I was concerned about poverty. I was concerned about justice, and it didn't seem like anybody was talking about race or poverty or justice. And I got really frustrated. I didn't think that this was the career for me. I decided to leave the law school after my first year and go to the School of Government. So I enrolled at Harvard School of Government, and I went over there the next year. And three months into that year, I had to wake up one morning and realize that I'm even more miserable here than I was at the law school. They were teaching us to maximize benefits and minimize costs, and it didn't seem to matter whose benefits got maximized and whose costs got minimized, and it just seemed alienating. And so I decided to go back to the law school, and I was trying to reconcile myself as a lawyer who would not have a terribly gratifying or satisfying life. I was trying to make peace with that. And then I took a course that required me to actually spend time in the Deep South. Uh, and I went with this, to this organization that was providing legal services to people on death row. And there I found a community of condemned people literally dying for legal assistance. There is no right to counsel in this country after your conviction has been imposed. And so we've got thousands of people, uh, some on death row, dying for legal help. And I met these people who showed me some things about their humanity and dignity, and all of a sudden I realized that maybe I could help condemned people. And it did something radical to my sense of what might be possible. I started doing this work, and through that work, I've gotten proximate to people. I've gotten proximate to children. The United States is the only country in the world that condemns children to die in prison. We have some 3,000 kids in this country who have been sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Some of them are as young as 13 years of age. There are 250,000 people serving long prison sentences for crimes they're accused of when they were children. There are uh, 10,000 kids on any given day live, uh, housed in jails and prisons where they're proximate to adults, where they face a great risk of sexual abuse. And this phenomenon was out there, but I couldn't understand it until I got proximate. I got involved in a case involving a 14-year-old boy who was living uh, in a household where his mother was repeatedly the target of a lot of domestic violence. Uh, and this boy's mother had a boyfriend that when he started drinking would get violent. And one day the man had been drinking, he came home, he called this boy's mother into the kitchen and she went into the kitchen and the man didn't say anything to her, he just punched her in the face. And she hit her head as she fell down and she fell on the floor and she was bleeding and unconscious. The little boy ran in to try to revive his mom and he saw her uh, lying on the floor. Uh, covered with blood, and he tried to get her to wake up. He tried to get her disturbed, but she wouldn't respond. And after 10 or 15 minutes, this child thought his mom was dead. The man had gone into a bedroom and fallen asleep, and this little boy got up, and he walked into that bedroom. He walked over to a dresser drawer where he knew this man kept his handgun, and he opened the drawer, and he pulled the gun out. And tragically, this boy walked over to where the man was sleeping, and he pointed the gun at the man. And the man was snoring, and when the man stopped snoring, this child tragically pulled the trigger, and he shot the man in the head. The man died almost instantly. Now, this child was about five feet tall. He was under 100 pounds. He'd never actually been in trouble before. He was the kind of kid uh, who had done decent in school. He was the kind of kid that might have been tried as a juvenile, but for the fact that the man that he shot and killed, his mother's boyfriend, well, he was a deputy sheriff. And because he was a deputy sheriff, the prosecutor insisted that this child be tried as an adult, and they immediately certified him to stand trial as an adult and put him in the adult jail. His grandmother called me after he'd been there three days and asked me to get involved, and I went over to the jail to talk to this little boy, and I was shocked at how small he was when he walked out, and he sat down. I started asking him questions, but no matter what I asked him, he wouldn't respond to a single thing I said. And finally, after 10 minutes, I said, look, I can't help you if you don't talk to me. You gotta talk to me. Come on, you gotta answer my questions. Wouldn't say a word. Just kept staring at the wall. And at some point, I got up and I walked around the table. I pulled my chair close to where he was sitting and I said, come on, you gotta talk to me. I can't help you if you won't talk to me. And he just kept staring. 
And at some point, I just started leaning on, leaning on him. I don't even know why, but I just leaned on him. And there was a point at which I felt him lean back. And he hadn't said a word, but when he leaned back, I put my arm around him and I said, come on, you got to talk to me. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. And when I did that, this little boy began to cry. And through his tears, he began talking to me, not about what happened with his mom, not about what happened with the man, but he started talking to me about what had happened at the jail. He told me on the first night, several men had hurt him. He told me on the next night, he'd been raped by several people. He told me on the next night, so many people had hurt him, he couldn't remember how many there had been. And I held this little boy while he cried hysterically for almost an hour. When I left the jail, I couldn't help but ask myself, who is responsible for this? And I realized that we are. We've allowed our distance from some children to create a system that is cruel and torturous and unjust. Right now, 10,000 children in adult jails or prisons. We got that little boy out of there, and I'm happy to say some wonderful people intervened in his life, and he's doing much better. But this need to get proximate cannot be overstated. It will change you. I left that jail, and I realized that I cannot stop until I get this country to recognize that all children are children. This fiction, this misguided thing that we have in our head that we can actually treat children the way they're not, as something that they're not, has got to be challenged. Proximity will empower you to challenge things that have to be challenged. It will. It will cause you to see things that need to be seen and do things that need to be done. I am persuaded that if we're serious about creating greater justice, we each have to get proximate to the things that matter. The second thing I'm persuaded is that we actually have to change the narrative. I don't think we can actually uh, just understand the problems that we care most about. I think we've got to change the narratives that are connected to those problems. There is a narrative behind mass imprisonment. We've had uh, 40 years of our political leaders uh, preaching the politics of fear and anger for generations. These elected leaders had wanted, uh, have been competing with each other over who can be the toughest on crime. And we uh, kind of all talk about all the things that we're going to do to people who uh, make us angry and afraid. And we've had this policy shape the way this country functions in some very profound and disturbing ways. That narrative has to change. We chose to deal with drug dependency in America as a crime problem. Other countries have chosen to deal with it as a health problem. They've gotten places that we haven't. They've seen lower levels of drug dependency. They've actually seen families recover as a result of one member having drug dependency. We've ripped apart families. We've got a million people in jails and prisons, some of them serving 30 and 40 year sentences for simple possession of marijuana. We've made habitual felony offender laws applicable to some of these crimes, and some people have been sentenced to life or imprisonment without parole. And it's not enough to know that, and it's not enough to say that that's wrong. We have to change the narrative behind that. I think we have to change the narrative about race in America. I don't think we've ever really committed ourselves to honest discourse about what racial justice requires. This country is compromised, it is haunted, it is living in a shadow that is cast by our history of racial inequality. And because we've never dealt with that, we are constantly bumping into one another and creating issues that create conflict and inequality and injustice. And I think we've got to change. We've got to change the narrative. I actually think we have to spend time talking about slavery in America. And you can say, well, why would we talk about slavery? It's because we've never really done it. You know, America was not like other countries that had slavery. There are lots of countries all across the world. Sometimes people say, oh, well, they had slaves in Africa. They did. They had slavery in Europe. They did. But those were societies with slavery. We became something different. We were actually quite unique. We became a slave society. We actually created an ideology to legitimate slavery. We wanted slave owners to feel comfortable and moral and just, even as they owned other human beings. And for me, the great evil of American slavery wasn't involuntary servitude. It was this narrative of racial difference that we created, this ideology of white supremacy. And the truth is, is that we never dealt with that. The 13th Amendment doesn't talk about the narrative of racial difference. It doesn't deal with white supremacy. The 13th Amendment dealt with involuntary servitude. And so in my mind, we didn't actually get past slavery. Slavery didn't end in 1865. It just evolved. If you come to my community in Montgomery, Alabama, you see a community that is that just saturated with monuments and markers 
uh, to the Confederacy. We love uh, talking about the mid-19th century uh, in the state of Alabama. Our, we've got 59 monuments and markers in Montgomery. Our two largest high schools are Jefferson Davis High and Robert E. Lee High. They're both 99% black. In Alabama, Confederate Memorial Day is a state holiday. Jefferson Davis's birthday is a state holiday. We don't have Martin Luther King Day. We have Martin Luther King slash Robert E. Lee Day. And this narrative has been allowed to continue, and as a result of it, we haven't done the hard things to free ourselves from this history. After slavery, there were decades of terrorism, lynching, and violence directed at communities of color. And I use the word terrorism because that's what it was. It wasn't a handful of people committing crimes against individuals. It was systematic terror. It was the whole society engaging in acts of intimidation. We just put out a report that documents 4,000 lynchings of African Americans, more than many people realized. And we talk about this as terrorism. And older people of color come up to me sometimes and they say, Mr. Stevenson, I get so upset when I hear someone on TV talking about how we're dealing with terrorism for the first time in our nation's history after 9-11. They say, we grew up with terrorism. We had to worry about being bombed and lynched and threatened and menaced our whole lives. And it provokes us when they use that word and they say we're dealing with it for the first time. This narrative has to change. I think we've got people of color all over this country, uh, people in uh, Los Angeles and Oakland and Detroit and Chicago and Cleveland and Boston and Philadelphia and New York. And many people don't realize that the geography of race and location in this country was shaped by terrorism. People of color didn't flee the South and go into these communities as people looking for new opportunities. They fled these regions as refugees from terror. And when you're working with a refugee population, there are special needs that have to be addressed that we've never addressed in this country. And because of that, it doesn't surprise me that we're constantly having conflicts and challenges. We still have people living in the margins. So I think that narrative has to change. At the end of uh, World War II, there was a recognition that the narrative had to change, that there had to be a commitment to truth and reconciliation in other countries. We didn't do that. We just carried on, and that's what gave rise to decades of segregation. And even when we talk about civil rights, I just came back uh, from Selma, my office is in Montgomery. We've been, uh, had all of these thousands of people come to the state to celebrate uh, the Selma to Montgomery march. And what worries me is that when we talk about civil rights in this country, we're very celebratory. It's almost as if the civil rights movement has been reduced to this three-day carnival. On day one, Rosa Parks didn't give up her seat on a bus. On day two, Dr. King led a march on Washington. And on day three, we changed all these laws. And if that were true, we'd be a wonderful society. But the truth is, is that the civil rights movement was in response to decades of humiliation, decades of suffering, decades of exclusion, decades of injury. We've got a generation of people who are white who were taught they're better than other people because of their skin color, and we haven't helped them recover from that lie. We needed truth and reconciliation at the end of that movement, and we didn't do it. And because of that, we've left ourselves vulnerable. In South Africa, after apartheid, there was truth and reconciliation. In Rwanda, the people realized that there can never really be progress uh, between uh, the Hutu and the Tutsis until there is truth and reconciliation. In Germany, if you go to Germany, that's a country that forces you to engage with the history of the Holocaust very differently. Uh, you're directed, they've marked and monumentalized and memorialized all the spaces where families were abducted and taken to the camps. You are encouraged to go to the camps and reflect soberly on the history of the Holocaust. We do the opposite in this country. We try to not talk about it. This community, Austin, Texas, dozens of lynchings all around us and none of us know where they took place because we don't talk about it. It was just in Waco, Texas, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. McLennan County had the second largest number of uh, lynchings uh, in the state, and none of them were marked. You've got a courthouse in that community that actually has a pain glass history and that celebrates their heritage, and one of the pains actually includes a noose where we're actually celebrating this legacy. That narrative has to change. It's difficult to change narratives because in many ways it means that everybody has to engage, but I am persuaded that without changing the narrative, we will not succeed in creating a more just society. Third thing, I should warn you, these get harder as I go along. I'm sorry about that. The third thing is that I am persuaded that if we're really going to change the world, if we're going to create more justice in the world, we've actually got to protect our hopefulness. I'm persuaded 
that injustice is a direct consequence of hopelessness. I believe that injustice prevails where hopelessness persists. And when I go into courtrooms and I see a hopeless judge and a hopeless prosecutor and a hopeless defense attorney, I know there's going to be a bad outcome. When I go into a school system and I see hopeless teachers trying to deal with hopeless sets of rules, I'm very worried about the future of our children. When I go into communities and I hear people talking about issues, but I hear them giving in to the despair and hopelessness that oftentimes emerges when things get complicated, I get very worried. Now you are a very kind of educated and informed and kind of curious community because you wouldn't be here but for that. And curiosity is really important. It's important that we actually try to figure things out that we read and we discover and we explore. But sometimes the complexity of the world deepens as we engage in that kind of adventure and the complexity of the world can oftentimes make us hopeless about what we can do. I think we have to be very curious. We've got to get uh, as deep into the issues we care about as possible. We've got to understand all the complexities, but we've also got to protect our hopefulness. Vaclav Havel talked about this. Havel said, the kind of hope you need to change the world isn't a preference for optimism over pessimism. It's not that pie in the sky stuff. It's rather an orientation of the spirit, a willing to, willingness to sometimes position yourself in hopeless places and be a witness. Now, we're all made hopeless by different things. We're vulnerable in different ways. I'll tell you that I'm particularly at risk when I have to hear people talking about uh, the old South because I grew up uh, in the segregated South and I saw the damage that that did. I don't like it uh, when people talk about the good old days. I don't like it when we romanticize that era. Uh, even though I'm here in Texas, I have to say I don't like the Confederate flags. I don't like the imagery of the old South. I don't like it when we're not dealing honestly with that portion of our history. I don't. It provokes me. It challenges me. And because I live in Alabama, I'm frequently provoked by these symbols and images. And I was going to a prison uh, not too long ago, and I parked my car to go see a client I'd never met before, and there was a truck in the prison yard. And this truck was like a shrine uh, to the Old South. It was covered with these Confederate flags. It had bumper stickers. It had the gun rack. It was like the shrine. And there were bumper stickers on this truck I'd actually never seen before. And one of the bumper stickers read, quote, if I'd known it was going to be like this, I'd have picked my own cotton. Had never seen that one before. And I was really agitated by it. And I went up to the door to go see my client. And there was a white guard there. And when I got to the door, this, I said, hi, I'm here for a legal visit. And this guard said to me, you're not a lawyer. I said, oh, yes, sir, I am. I've been to this prison before. I'm here for a legal visit. He said, you're not a lawyer. I don't believe you. And then he asked me for my bar card. I said, well, my bar card is in the car, but I've never had to show my bar card before. Well, I'm not letting you in here until I see a bar card. So he made me go back to my car and get my bar card to show to him that I was an attorney. And I did it, but I was a little insulted. And I said, look, I want to see my client now. And he said, well, you're going to have to get in the bathroom. I'm going to give you a strip search before I let you in. I said, no, sir. Lawyers don't get strip search coming into a prison. He said, you come into my prison, you're going to get strip search. I asked people to help me, and none of the other guards would intervene. And so I had to go into this bathroom. I'd driven three hours. I wasn't prepared to kind of go back. And I subjected myself to this humiliating strip search. You take off all your clothes. You do all of these humiliating things. And I came back out, and I was trying to recover some dignity. And I said to this guard, I said, look, I want to see my client now. And the guard said, well, you've got to go back there and sign the book. I said, lawyers don't have to sign that book. You're coming into my prison. You're going to go back there and sign the book. So I did. Finally, this man let me into the prison, and I was about to walk through the door. And he grabbed me by the arm, and he said, wait, let me ask you something. He said, did, uh, did you see that truck out there with all of those bumper stickers and flags? I said, yeah, I saw that truck. He said, I want you to know that that's my truck. Really provoked me. Really provoked me. I was sitting in the prison yard just angry, and my client came out. It was a man I'd never met before. It was an African-American man, young man. He came out. He sat down. And the first thing the client said to me was, quote, did you bring me a chocolate milkshake? And I thought to myself, this is the strangest day I've had in a really long time. I said, no, I didn't bring you a chocolate milkshake. I'm your lawyer. I'm here to represent you. I've got some questions. And I started asking my questions when he wasn't responding. And I realized he was still hung up on this milkshake. So I put my pen down. I said, look, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you wanted me to bring you a chocolate milkshake. The next time I come, if they let me, I'll bring you a chocolate milkshake. And this man smiled and smiled and smiled. Terribly disabled person, horribly disabled person, uh, terribly abused and neglected as a child. He was in 29 foster homes by the time he was 10 years old. He began showing signs of bipolar disorder when he was 12 or 13, and he didn't have medical care available to him, so he started using crack cocaine. 
By the time he was uh, 15, he was using heroin and began showing symptoms of schizophrenia. By the time he was 17, he was having actually psychotic episodes and he was homeless, roaming uh, the streets uh, in his community. By the time he was 19, in the midst of a psychotic episode, he committed a horrific crime and killed someone. He was quickly arrested and charged with capital murder. The trial lasted a day and a half. He was convicted and sentenced to death. I got the record, I read through the record, and at no point in the record could I find the word mental health, mental illness, mental disease. Nobody had raised the issue of his disability, nobody. We have a system of justice in this country that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. And the poor and the vulnerable and the disabled are being horribly mistreated day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out. So we decided to represent this man and we started working on his case. We came up with some really powerful evidence to document his mental illness. We had some great experts agree to testify. I had some foster parents who were going to acknowledge what had happened to him. And finally, it was time to go to court. And we went to the courthouse and I got there. And I had my evidence all ready and I walked in there and I saw that guard who I hadn't seen before and realized that he was the guard that had brought my client to court. I went over to my client, had explained to him I couldn't bring him a milkshake, which was our little ritual, and then asked him if he was okay, and he said he was fine. And for the next three days, we put on our case, and we had our experts testifying, we had our witnesses testifying, and I felt pretty good about it after the three days of hearing. And about a month later, I decided to go back to the prison to go see this man. And when I got to the prison, I parked my car, and lo and behold, what do I see in the parking lot but that truck? And I just didn't want to have to deal with it. I didn't. And even though I'd driven three hours, I decided I'd just come back another day. And I turned around to go back to my car, and then I started remembering that song they used to sing when I was a kid during the Civil Rights Movement. They used to sing this song, Can't Let Nobody Turn Me Around, Turn Me Around, Turn Me Around. And I realized that that wasn't the right thing for me to do. So I grabbed my bar card, and I decided I'm just going to deal with this guy. And I walked up to the prison uh, guard, and sure enough, there he was at the front of the prison. I said, hey, I'm here for a legal visit. Here's my bar card. And the man immediately said to me, he said, hello, Mr. Stevenson, how are you? I said, I'm fine. I said, I'm going to go in the bathroom and get ready for your search. He said, oh, Mr. Stevenson, we're not going to do that today. I said, well, thank you. It kind of threw me. I said, well, I'll go over here and sign the book. He said, Mr. Stevenson, I saw you coming, and I signed you in. Absolutely surprised me. I said, well, thank you. He said, yes, sir. He walked me over to the door, and I was trying to figure out what was going on. And when we got to the door, I watched this man try to unlock the lock, and he couldn't do it. His hands started to shake. His right hand was shaking. His left hand was shaking. It's a padlock. He couldn't get the key in the lock. And I was standing there staring at him, and eventually he got the key in the lock. He unlocked the door. And when he looked up, his face was red. I thought he was about to cry, and he looked at me, and he said, Mr. Stevenson, I have to say something to you. He said, I just want you to know that I was in that courtroom for those three days and I was listening. And then he said, I want you to know I think what you're doing is a good thing. He said, I came up in the foster care system too. He said, I didn't think anybody had it as bad as I did, but I realized that maybe your client had it worse than I did. He said, I learned some things listening and I just want you to know I think what you're doing is a good thing and I hope you keep fighting for justice. I would have never guessed it, never predicted it, never thought it possible. He put his hand out and said, can I please shake your hand, sir? Never guessed it. I shook his hand. I said, you know, I, I can't tell you what it means to me that, that you just said that. I really do appreciate it. He said, yes, sir. I turned to go into the prison, and he grabbed me by the arm. He said, wait, wait, wait. i got to tell you something else. I said, what's that? Well, I just want you to know, he said, that I did something on the way back from the courthouse to the prison. I said, what you do? Well, on the way back to the prison, I decided to take an exit, and I took your client to a Wendy's, and I bought him a chocolate milkshake. It's a really silly story, but it speaks to me about our need to stay hopeful about what we can do. When you hear people saying, well, these people can't do this, and these people can't do that, and this situation can't change, and that situation can't change, we need people who are prepared to say, that's not true. We have to believe things that we have not seen. I've been representing people on condemned, uh, condemned people for a really long time, and we've had a lot of success. We've gotten about 115 people off death row who will never be at risk of execution. If you asked me if that was possible, I would have really struggled to say yes, but yet it can happen. And this dynamic of being someone who's prepared to stand when everybody else is sitting, who's prepared to speak when everybody else is quiet, I am persuaded is essential to creating greater justice. You cannot move forward without hope. You can't. 
and protecting your hopefulness, I am persuaded, is one of the essential things we can and must do to create greater opportunities for justice in this country. Fourth and finally, I am persuaded that we cannot actually move forward. We can't create justice in America. We can't do the things that change the world unless we're sometimes willing to do things that are uncomfortable. I hate to say that because I know it's difficult and human beings are actually programmed to do what's comfortable. We love comfort. I love comfort. I'm not against comfort. But sometimes we have to choose to do things that are uncomfortable. We're just by nature people who like to be in comfortable spaces. You come into a room like this, you sit in a place that's comfortable for you, you see people you know, that's where you want to go. Doing what's comfortable comes really easy for us. Doing what's uncomfortable is incredibly foreign. We actually have to make a choice to do it. And I do want to stress, again, I'm not against comfort. You know, I don't, you know, I flew to Mississippi to give a talk not too long ago, and I got off the plane, and the people uh, came to get me at the airport. When I got there, they said, oh, Mr. Stevenson, we know all about you. We've read about you. We know what kind of person you are. And, and uh, we're having our conference at the luxurious uh, Double Tree Hotel, and we've decided that you wouldn't want to stay at the luxurious Double Tree Hotel. So we asked one of the farmers if they would put you up at the barn. And I said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Of course I want to stay at the luxurious Double Tree Hotel. I like the chocolate chip cookie just like everybody else. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is sometimes choosing to do uncomfortable things because they are necessary to create greater justice. If we want to tell the true story of the Civil Rights Movement, it was a movement populated by people who chose to do uncomfortable things. They went to uncomfortable places where uncomfortable things would happen to them. They faced uncomfortable risks. It was all about our willingness to endure discomfort, threat, menace, pain, insecurity, uncertainty in service of something. And that dynamic has not changed. Now, I will tell you that you can do a lot of really great things. And I'm sure many of you have done a lot of really great things. And you begin, can begin to feel like, well, I don't, shouldn't have to keep doing uncomfortable things. You ought to get to a point in your life where you don't have to do any more uncomfortable things. But the truth is, is that it doesn't work like that. I've been representing people on death row for 30 years, and I sort of feel like, well, at this point, you know, hope and comfort all will just kind of follow me around. But it doesn't happen like that. We had a bunch of executions in Alabama between 2009 and 2011. Alabama sometimes has a higher execution rate than Texas. And in that two-year time period, we actually had a higher rate of executions per capita uh, than the state of Texas. We had 17 executions, uh, one every other month. We don't have a public defender system. There is no right to counsel. And me and my staff decided to stand and fight for these people with execution dates, and it was just killing us. It was just terror, and we were just being so beat down by it. My young lawyers uh, were especially affected, and after a few, I said, look, you guys take a break. I'm going to handle the next couple. And I got involved in the next case with an execution date, and it was a man who was intellectually disabled. And in this country, you can't execute people with intellectual disability. The Supreme Court has banned the execution of people with mental retardation, but no lawyer had raised the issue. They hadn't raised it at trial. They hadn't raised it on appeal. They hadn't raised it in collateral appeals. He was too poor to get the legal help he needed. And so when we tried to raise the issue, all the courts kept saying, too late, too late, too late. We have a system that prioritizes finality over fairness. And even though this man legally, in my judgment, could not be executed, it was unconstitutional, nobody would take it up. And I kept trying to get a court to take it seriously, and nobody would. And on the day that he was scheduled to be executed, I finally got the last call from the Supreme Court denying our motion for a stay. I called this man up and I was on the phone talking to him in what was a really painful moment. Because in addition to being intellectually disabled, this person also suffered from a severe speech impediment. He couldn't get his words out whenever he got anxious or nervous. And because we were just a few minutes from the execution date, he couldn't really get his words out. He begged me not to get off the phone until he told me what he needed to tell me. And so I stood there holding the phone while this man was trying to talk and my heart was heavy. And he was trying to get his words out, and he couldn't. And the harder he tried to talk, the more he tried to get his words out, the more it just seemed to break my heart. And there were tears uh, running down my face as I held the phone listening to this man trying to get his words out. I could hear the guards in the background pushing him to get off the phone because they had to get ready for the execution. 
And he kept trying and he kept trying and it was breaking my heart. And I remembered something that evening I'd actually forgotten until that point. When I was about nine or 10, my mother took me to church one Sunday morning and I was there with my brother and my friends and we were talking and there was a little tiny skinny kid who was standing next to one of, uh, one of my friends and he wasn't saying anything. And at some point I turned to this little boy and I asked him a question. I said, well, you know, what's your name or where are you from or something like that. And I remembered how when I asked this question, this little boy couldn't get his words out. He also had a very severe speech impediment. And because I was young and I'd never met anybody with that challenge, I did something really ignorant when this boy couldn't get his words out. I laughed. And my mother saw me laughing at this child and she gave me this look I'd never seen before and she came over and grabbed me by the arm and she pulled me aside and she said, Brian, don't you ever laugh at somebody because they can't get their words out right. Don't you ever do that. And I tried to defend myself. I said, I'm sorry, mom, I didn't know, I didn't. She said, no, 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 you know better than that. And then she said, now I want you to go back over there and tell that little boy you're sorry. I said, okay, mom. And I took a step and she grabbed me by the arm. She said, wait. After you tell that little boy you're sorry, I want you to hug that little boy. I sort of rolled my eyes, but I said, okay, mom. And I took a step and she grabbed me by the arm. She said, wait, after you hug that little boy, I want you to tell that little boy you love him. I said, mom, I cannot go over there and tell that little boy. And she gave me that look again, so I said, okay. And I remembered that night walking over to that little boy and going up to him and saying, uh, look, man, you know, I'm sorry. And what I remembered was how I lunged at him and gave him my little boy version of a man hug. And what I'd forgotten until that moment was how I remembered saying to this child as insincerely as I possibly could, I said to him, I said, look, um, I love you. And what I'd forgotten was how that little boy hugged me back and said flawlessly in my ear, he said, I love you too. And I was thinking about that while this man was trying to get the words out and the tears were coming down my face. And finally the man got his words out and he said, I just wanna thank you for representing me. I wanna thank you for fighting for me. And then he said, I love you for trying to save my life. They pulled him away, they strapped him on the, electric, uh, on the gurney and they executed him. I hung up the phone and the first thing I thought was I can't do this anymore. It's too hard, too hard, too hard, too hard, too hard. This is too hard. I kept thinking about how broken he was. And I just couldn't answer this question that was in my head. And the question was, why do we want to kill all the broken people? What is it about us that when we see brokenness, we want to crush it? We ignore it. We push it to the side. We put it in the shadows. We cover it up. We don't want to have anything to do with people who are broken. And I realized that all of my clients are broken people. They've been broken by poverty. They've been broken by racism. They've been broken by disability. They've been broken by a lack of intervention. They've been broken by hopelessness. They've been broken by despair. Broken, broken, broken. And then I realized I work in a broken system, system compromised by cynicism and distance and fear and anger. And then I realized my life is filled with brokenness. And I said, I don't want this life. Too much brokenness. Why am I even doing this? And that's when I had to have that conversation. I said, if you're not gonna do it anymore, Brian, then you gotta understand why you've been doing it. And I realized something I'd never realized before. I realized that night that I don't do what I do because it's important. I don't do what I do because I've been trained to do it. I don't do what I do because somebody has to do it. I don't do what I do because there's some unique challenge. I don't do what I do because it's justice. I don't do what I do because I get to talk to wonderful people like you. I don't do what I do because there's money because there's no money. I don't do what I do because there's some uh, special meaning. I realized something that night that I'd never realized before and I realized that I do what I do because I'm broken too. And the truth is, is that when you get proximate and when you struggle to change narratives and when you protect your hope even in the face of a lot of hopelessness and when you do uncomfortable things, it will break you. You'll pick up little injuries, you'll pick up these moments of pain and confusion, but I'm also persuaded that it's brokenness that teaches us the power of what it means to be human. It's what allows us to say no when we want to kill and crush the broken. It's what allows us to say no when we want to hide the broken among us. And we realize that you're not trying to do something for somebody else, you're trying to do it for yourself. I'm not trying to save condemned people, I'm just trying to save myself because I am a part of that broken community. I realized my clients have taught me really simple things. I believe that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I think if somebody tells a lie, they're not just a liar. I think if somebody takes something that doesn't belong to them, they're not just a thief. I think even if you kill somebody, you're not just a killer. 
And because of that, there is this human dignity that must be respected. Somebody's got to stand up and say, no, well, this is what else this person is before we can treat them fairly and justly and punish them responsibly. I'm also persuaded that in this country that the opposite of poverty is not wealth. We talk too much about wealth in America. We're preoccupied with wealth. Uh, we think that wealth is the answer to all of our problems, but I'm persuaded that that's not true. I don't believe that the opposite of poverty is wealth in America. I am persuaded that the opposite of poverty is justice. And we need to talk more about justice. We need to figure out how we create just relationships and just responses to the conditions and structures and systems that have created so much despair. And finally, I believe that you cannot judge the character of a community, the quality of life in a community, its commitment to the rule of law, its civility, by how talented people are at settings like South by Southwest, by how imaginative people are at settings like South by Southwest, by how creative people are. I don't think you can judge a community by that. I think you judge the quality of life in a community, its character, not by how creative and brilliant, not by how we treat the powerful and the rich and the privileged. I think you judge a community by how it treats the poor, the incarcerated, the disfavored, and the condemned. Because that's the greatest reflection of where our hearts and minds come together. I think that we can make profound changes in this country. I do. I think that individuals can, I think communities can, but I think it requires that we get proximate, that we change narratives, that we protect our hopefulness, and we do uncomfortable things. I'll end with this. I think there's a different metric system for those of you who care deeply about justice, for those of you who care deeply about greater equality, for those of you who care deeply about children who are marginalized, for those of you who care deeply about a range of issues from the environment to how we deal with people who are minorities in whatever context that we're talking about, religious minorities, sexual minorities. I think for those of you who care about fairness and equality and justice, I want you to accept that there's a different metric system. You can't measure your worth by how much money you make. You can't measure your worth by how much people applaud you. You can't even measure your worth by how much people say what you're doing is good or bad. There's a different metric system. I was giving a talk in a church not too, too, too long ago, and it was a uh, an older man who came into this church it was somewhere in the Black Belt of Alabama, some rural country church, and I was in there to give a talk, but this older man came into the church in a wheelchair, and he was sitting in the back of the church, and he was staring at me the whole time I was talking, and had this really angry look on his face. He just kept staring at me, and he was actually distracting me because he had this very angry look, and I thought he was really, really upset. And I kept looking at him, but I couldn't pay too much attention. And I got through my talk, and at the end of my talk, all these young people came up to me, and they were very nice, but that man in the back was still staring at me. And eventually, after everybody left, this man got a, a young kid to wheel him up to me. And they wheeled this uh, man up to me in the middle of the church, and he came up the aisle, and he still had that very angry look on his face, and he got in front of me, and he said, do you know what you're doing? And I couldn't figure out what to say. And he asked me again, he said, do you know what you're doing? And I stepped back and I started mumbling something. I couldn't figure out how to respond to this. And then he asked me one last time. He said, do you know what you're doing? And then he said, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. And this man looked at me. He says, you're beating the drum for justice. And I was so moved. He says, you're beating the drum for justice. He says, you keep beating the drum for justice. And I was moved. And he said, come here, come here, come here. And he grabbed me by my jacket and he pulled me into the wheelchair. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to show you something. And then he turned his head and he said, you see the scar I have behind my right ear? He said, I got that scar in Greene County, Alabama, trying to register people to vote in 1963. He turned his head. He said, you see this cut down here? You see my scar down there? He said, I got that in Philadelphia, Mississippi during Freedom Summer. He turned his head. You see, see this dark spot? He said, that's my bruise. I got my bruise in Birmingham, Alabama during the Children's Crusade. And then he said to me, he says, I'm going to tell you something, young man. He said, people look at me. They think I'm some old man in a wheelchair covered with cuts and bruises and scars. But I'm going to tell you something. He said, these aren't my cuts. These aren't my bruises. These aren't my scars. He said, these are my medals of honor. We need more people who are prepared to engage in uncomfortable, challenging things to create a greater community, greater justice. I am persuaded that all of us can do it. We just have to be fueled not just with the ideas in our mind, but the conviction in our heart. It excites me uh, to be in a space like this, uh, at a setting like South by Southwest, with so much talent and energy and commitment, because I'm persuaded that if we use just a portion of that, 
to get closer to people in spaces where there's great need, to change narratives, to be hopeful and to do uncomfortable things, we can change the world. We can create greater justice. And it's with that hope that I'm really, really excited to have had this opportunity to be with you and look forward to meeting some of you at the book signing. Thank you very much. Kids that'll turn 16 and won't go to the driver's license. Yeah. You know, I hear parents frustrated their kids won't get a driver's license. So the, the millennials view cars as a utility, not as a social statement, which is a huge shift for North America. Now, which goes back to you when you said that uh, how, you were talking about how many jobs Uber had created.